I apologize straight away because the, the title is a little more sophisticated than the talk because it's one of those things when you make the title six months ago, it sounded great. But I, I couldn't get past the, the issue, the basic issue of just choosing a mechanical valve or a tissue valve. And so really that's what the, the talk will focus on. It, it has something to do with matching the prosthesis to the patient, but it's, it's even more basic than that um, and has to do with the simple selection of a mechanical or tissue valve. Uh, these are the disclosures uh, in cardiac surgery. We do have uh, uh, research support from the drug or from the valve companies and from one of the drug companies. And the other disclosure is to is to show uh, you all exactly what we do. And and this is the total number of prosthetic devices that are inserted each year. And overall, for all valves, aortic, uh, mitral, tricuspid, pulmonary, and so forth, about a third of the valves are mechanical, and about two thirds are tissue valves. Now, in the aortic position, it's a little different because of the elderly patients with aortic stenosis. So, in our practice at Mayo, about 30% are mechanical and 70% are tissue valves. This is this is uh, very much in line with most other centers in the U.S. Uh, I think if you look at the STS overall, it's about to, it's about what we use. There are some people that say, well, now it's 20% mechanical and mechanical valves are going away in the aortic position and so forth. Uh, but in general, I think this is in line with the practice in the United States. Now, it, it's always good to bounce back to the guidelines when you're talking about something as basic as, as tissue valves and mechanical valves. And although the guidelines have been updated one time since then, it really didn't have to do with the selection of valves. It had more to do with some other aspects of valve disease. So the, the, the guidelines as they read in 2006 are, are pretty straightforward. And I think most people would find this non-controversial. Uh, it says that for most patients over the age of 65, you receive a bioprosthesis. It goes on to say there are no data involving large numbers of patients that clearly show a long-term advantage of one type of aortic valve operation over another for any individual or any individual prosthesis over another. But the guidelines go on to say that at many major valve surgery centers, the age threshold for the use of bioprosthetic valves in the aortic position is decreased to well below 65 in those patients who do not wish to take anticoagulation. The decision requires full discussion with the patient, the understanding, and so forth. Now, when you see something like this in a guideline, you know that there was a very persuasive, strong personality in the room because this was, this was put in there with, with no data. It was just that this is the way we do it at our center, and that person seemed to hold the day or at least last longer in the, in the guideline session than anybody else. So let's take a look at the business about advantages of one type of prosthesis over another. Now, the first thing to think about is how long do patients live and who's elderly and that sort of thing. Now, these, these are not valve patients. These are just men and women in Minnesota. And when you get, a, when you get an actuarial curve and you're comparing your whatever against the age and gender matched population, that's what this is. So this is an age and these, this is just the normal survival of someone without heart disease who happens to be 65 years old in Minnesota. And you can see that if you're a woman and you're 60, or if you're a man, a woman and you're 65, you have a 50-50 chance of living 20 years. So if you choose a bioprosthesis for somebody who's 65 who's a woman, there's a 50-50 chance that that bioprosthesis is going to have to last 50 years if they don't have any other medical illnesses and their heart disease is under control. And even for men, there's at least a one in three chance that if you're 65, you're gonna live, you're gonna live another 20 years. Now, the, the people that say you ought to make this, you ought to make this uh, thresh, age threshold lower for using a bioprosthesis, if you move that back a bit, you can see that you're gonna have well over half of the women are gonna live 25 years and there's no bioprosthesis on the market that's gonna last that long. So what's gonna happen is you're gonna have a lot of reoperations in 80 year olds and that's not a good thing to have. 
Now, the the basic selection of a tissue valve or a mechanical valve, these are the these are the patient issues, and these are the kinds of things that patients ask me, and I suspect that they ask you. They they want to know about the durability of the valve, how long will it last? Tissue valves last longer than or don't last as long as mechanical valves. There's a concern about blood clots. They know about thromboembolism. Uh, patients don't like to take Coumadin because of bleeding, but I put Coumadin down again because it's not just the bleeding they worry about. They don't like taking the medicine and, and monitoring it, so that's another reason that they want a bioprosthesis. And there's still some patients that are that are concerned about noise. I get I get questions about noise uh, with valves, but if you look at this list, you'll see two things that are not there. And, and the two things that are not there are survival. I've never had a patient ask me whether they would live longer with a mechanical valve or a tissue valve ever. Uh, and I've never had a patient ask me about hemodynamics. Now, now hemodynamics are something that surgeons argue about at, at valve meetings all the time, but it, it's not very important to patients. Now, the physicians have different set of issues with mechanical versus tissue valves. I think it's probably easier for you to advise your patient to have a valve operation if they don't have to take Coumadin. So it's just there's there's increased patient acceptance if you're talking to them about a tissue valve. I, I think that's fair. Uh, and for you and for the surgeon too, it's a little easier to manage a patient with a tissue valve because you, you may or may not give them Coumadin for three months and then you put them on aspirin and then you don't have to worry about getting them in to see someone to get their INR check. And then you've probably heard too many surgeons tell you that, well, gee, even if they need a reoperation, the reoperation is safe. So that's another one. Um, and all of this business with a tissue valve maybe is the way to go fits with our current notion that, well, in the future, we may just put in a percutaneous valve if that tissue valve fails. So these are these are the kinds of things that, that we hear uh, in our meetings, in our conversations as surgeons, and I suspect many of you have said these same things to your patients and to your colleagues. And if you have, I apologize, because the next part of this could make you feel uncomfortable. Um, let's go back and, and talk about the business about survival. Uh, you read the guidelines that there's no data that suggests that there's an advantage of one valve over another. And that's not quite true. There's a VA study that, that was uh, conducted in 1977 through 82 and then had a 16-year follow-up. And they randomized a valve that's not available anymore but was a good mechanical valve, the bjork shiley valve, to the Hancock tissue valve, 575 men. The average age of these patients was 59 years, so this is kind of the age group that we're talking about that some people say you should go back down and use a tissue valve, and they had a follow-up of 16 years. And there's a couple of very important points. The first thing that they found was that there's no difference in thromboembolism, and that's something that every study shows. If your patient's concerned about thromboembolism and says, I want a tissue valve because I don't want a blood clot, there's, there's never been a study that shows that the risk of thromboembolism is lower with a tissue valve versus an anticoagulated uh, mechanical valve, and that's what the VA study showed. There's also no difference in endocarditis, but at the end of 16 years, what they did find was a difference in survival, and this is published data. It's out there in the public domain. Um, 15 years later, 79% of patients with mechanical valves were alive versus 66% of patients with tissue valves, a randomized study. Now, there's been another randomized study, and again, this, these are done with, with the old model valves, but it, there's another study out there that's called the Edinburgh trial. Well, let, let, me, let me just finish up with, with the bleeding. This is the VA trial here, and it shows the incidence of bleeding, any bleeding, uh, over 16-year follow-up, and you notice, the first thing you notice is that patients that have mechanical valves with Coumadin have about a 50% incidence of some bleeding complication over 16 years, but patients that have tissue valves have about a 30%. So the other important point is that if you choose a tissue valve for your patient, don't think that you're not going to have a bleeding problem because about a third of the patients will have that if you wait long enough. So there's yes, there's a difference between bleeding complications with mechanical and tissue valves, but it's not the difference between zero and all. It's the difference between 30% and 50%. Now, there was this other study is the is the Edinburgh trial, and it was a randomized trial between 75 and 79. It also used a Bjork-Shiley valve, uh, 
uh, and it was either the Hancock or the CE valve. This, valve. this study did include women. In fact, women were the majority of the patients in the study. The follow-up extended to 20 years, and once again, they showed no difference in the instance of thromboembolism uh, over the course of the follow-up. Now, this, the, the Edinburgh randomized trial showed no difference in survival. There was the, the patients with mechanical valves, if you looked at the curves, they were a little bit better than the patients with tissue valve, but the difference was not statistically significant. So one, trial, one study, one randomized trial showed or favored a mechanical valve, the other showed not much difference. But the Edinburgh trial, like, like the VA trial, also showed a difference uh, in bleeding. And this is just the, this is just the serious bleeding events uh, over a 20-year follow-up. And that occurred in 8% of the patients on Coumadin with mechanical valves, but it also occurred in 5% of patients that had tissue valves. So if you use a tissue valve, don't think that your patient is immune from bleeding complications. So are these mitral valves with atrial fibrillation? Yep, we'll show you just, yep, we'll show you in just a minute here. And, and the reason for that is, as uh, Dr. Kirsch pointed out, is that a number of patients will, will require Coumadin for other reasons. And so here's the, here it is. These are, these are patients with aortic valve. All these patients had tissue valves. The aortic valves are shown here and the mitral valves are shown here. And you can see at five years, about 15% of patients that had an aortic prosthesis five years later on Coumadin. And if you follow them long enough, a third of the aortic valves will require Coumadin for some other medical condition, probably atrial fibrillation, but there are other reasons that you have to take Coumadin. So once again, if you use a tissue valve in your patients, the chance of needing Coumadin is lower than with a mechanical valve, but it's not zero. And in fact, it's substantial if you follow the patients long enough. Now, this is a study I'm sure that's, that's familiar to all of you. The argument is, well, we'll use this and we'll use a tissue valve in somebody in their 60s because as you get older, you don't want to be on Coumadin. But in fact, the benefit of Coumadin, at least for atrial fibrillation and probably for, for mechanical valves is, is the same. It certainly is no worse. The benefit of Coumadin is greatest in patients who are older. In fact, if you look at the net clinical benefit of, of warfarin for atrial fibrillation, the net clinical benefit when you look at bleeding versus thromboembolism in patients with atrial fibrillation is highest in the older patients than it is in the younger patients. So this notion that we should avoid Coumadin in older patients is probably not true. Now, we had known about, this, uh, about these trials of mechanical valves and tissue valves and thought like most other surgeons and clinicians that, that the, really those trials are, are so dated and because they use valves that are no longer available, we should look in our current practice. And of course, we haven't randomized patients with valves here, but we did what we thought was the next best thing. We looked at a group of patients that had either the St. Jude uh, by leaflet valve and patients that had the most current generation of the Carpentier Edwards uh, pericardial valve. And we did match pairs. So we got patients that were as close together as possible uh, for age, gender, presence of coronary disease, and valve size. So these patients were fairly well matched in, a, in a, I think, a good uh, comparison population. And we expected to see, to not see those differences that we saw in the VA trial. But guess what? This was a survival of the patients from the Mayo Clinic that had either tissue valves or mechanical valves and were matched for everything that you can match them for. There was about a 15% better survival in patients that had mechanical valves. Now, this was presented at one of our meetings, and of course, everyone stood up, and most surgeons are biased towards tissue valves nowadays for reasons that aren't clear, but uh, the, the, the conversation went like this. Well, in a database, you can't allow for all of those clinical characteristics that define good patients from bad patients, and the patients that had the mechanical valves are good patients. And that, that probably is true to a certain extent, but I think it's probably also balanced by the fact that there's an awful lot of patients in the younger group, in this 50 to 60 group, uh, 
that took tissue valves because they said, I go out and I hike and I'm just too vigorous to take a mechanical valve. And I think you all, have, everybody has seen a patient like that. They don't want to, they, I'm too young and healthy to have a mechanical valve. That's for the older patient. Uh, I want a tissue valve because I snow ski, da, 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 da. So I think that there may be some selection bias, but actually it works both ways. And if you, if we then looked at a multivariable analysis of the, of, of the factors that led to mortality in this group, it's all the usual suspects. Uh, the risk of death was higher if you had renal disease, lung disease, diabetes, coronary disease, advanced New York heart class, women did a little worse, decreased ejection fraction, et cetera, et cetera. And you get down to those variables that were protective, take an aspirin, that was a good thing. And if you had a mechanical valve, that was a good thing. So a mechanical valve was an independent predictor of survival after you allow for all of those uh, risk factors and after you match the patients as well as you can. At least at the Mayo Clinic, patients live longer with mechanical valves. Now, you know, this, we, we were sort of the, we feel like we're the voice in the wilderness uh, sometimes because there is this bias towards tissue valves in many centers. And it was interesting, this is a study um, from Naples and it and a subsequent study that I'll show you were in the same edition of the Annals of Thoracic Surgery. And uh, I've, I don't think I've ever seen this, this paper uh, referenced. And it's interesting because these guys looked at the quality of life in patients with tissue valves and mechanical valves, asking the question, well, if, a, if you use a mechanical valve, do, are patients less happy with it than they would be with a tissue valve where they didn't have to take Coumadin? So the main thing had to do with quality of life, but they also looked at survival. These are 80-year-olds in Italy. And here's the survival of 80-year-olds in Italy with the mechanical valve in yellow and the bioprosthesis in orange. And guess what? There was a statistically significant improvement in, survi in survival in patients with mechanical valve. Now, these authors were very conservative and said this is probably due to patient selection and yada, yada, yada. But again, even in the oldest age group, there was no, there certainly is no penalty to pay for putting in a mechanical valve. And you could argue that patients did better. Now, I, I wonder how many people show these kinds of survival curves to your patients before you select a heart valve. Now, in, they, they also found, this is interesting, this is the bioprosthetic group in yellow and the mechanical valve group in, in green. And you can see that there's no difference in quality of life when you look at all of these domains, physical functioning, general health, vitality. And in fact, if you have cardiac surgery in Italy, you're a happier camper than if you're just an average elderly Italian. So remember that too when you're seeing your older patients that we can make you happier. So that was, that was in the Annals of Thoracic Surgery in uh, 2008, and in the very same issue was this paper. And again, it was from Italy. The, the, the Italians are big on this comparison of tissue valves. And, and they looked at quality of life also, mechanical valves versus tissue valves, and this is what they found. They found better survival in 80-year-olds that had mechanical valves. Again, saying, you know, they qualified it. This, this wasn't the purpose of their study. They were looking at quality of life, and they qualified it with, well, we maybe selected patients who were better candidates or were going to live longer, et cetera, et cetera. But it is what it is. It's better survival with, with a, a mechanical prosthesis. Well, it's better survival really early than 30 days already. Uh -huh. And this is survival to cardiac death in that same group. Uh, it's not quite statistically significant, but... You know what it it this looks like. There's separation of curves beyond about six years, which is what you would expect with a with a tissue uh, failure. And they also found no difference in quality of life when you compare patients with tissue valves and mechanical valves. And they, these are 80 year old patients, so you know again, there's there's doesn't seem to be a big penalty to pay for anticoagulating patients as regards their quality of life. Now. That was, all of that was interesting to us. And then in the, uh, in Jack, in, in the, at the end of last year was this. And this, this was a randomized study. It was only 310 patients, but it, but 
but it was randomized and carried out very well, again from Italy. I will point out for all the Italians in the audience that they seem to have a, a little better handle on this. And they, they randomized patients to, to mechanical valves or biological valves, and, and this, you might think, would, uh, would answer the question. 55 to 70 years of age, randomized study, and they found that there wasn't really any difference in survival. They said at 13 years, patients undergoing aortic valve replacement with either mechanical prosthesis or bioprosthesis had a similar survival, as well as the same rate of recurrence of thromboembolism, bleeding endocarditis. So they found no difference in bleeding or endocarditis with a mechanical valve or a tissue valve, but they also found no difference in survival. So you might say, well, this really answers that question about whether you introduced a bias by looking at the, the things retrospectively. But you don't have to dig very far into this paper to make you ask the question about whether that's really the proper conclusion. Because here's the survival curve. Now, I, you know, this is not statistically significant, but guess which curve is on top and which curve is on bottom. And it's even more impressive if you look at cardiac-related survival. If you look at cardiac-related survival in a randomized trial, and again, there's only 15 patients out uh, 12 years in, in one group and 21 in the other group, there is, I would say, a suggestion that patients with mechanical valves live longer than tissue valves. And I think they interpreted this very conservatively to say there's no significant difference. But, you know, how many curves do you have to look at with mechanical valves that do a little better with tissue valves uh, to be a little uncomfortable with the notion that there's absolutely no difference in survival. And this is, this is sort of all adverse events, uh, bleeding, thromboembolism, reoperation, and so forth. Now that's, you know, that's a combined endpoint, but there it is. Now I gave, I gave a talk very much like this to, uh, um, at a meeting in Canada, and uh, at, during the discussion, uh, Eric Jameson, who is a surgeon that does lots of research on outcomes of uh, valve disease, was was upset that I didn't include his latest paper, which was published that same month. So I, I felt like I didn't miss it too badly. He said, "Well, you didn't you didn't include our data," and I said, "I didn't know I wasn't aware of your data." And then he gave me his reference, which was which was that month. And what Jameson did was he, in the, in the patients in Vancouver, they, they were looking at the impact of uh, patient prosthesis mismatch. And they had 3,300 patients looking at survival and the influence of patient prosthesis mismatch on survival. And there, he, they followed the patients up to 15 years and they said in their series that patient prosthesis mismatch was not a predictor of overall unadjusted mortality regardless of the category of effective orifice area index. Now, this is one of those topics that surgeons argue about all the time, and it's probably not as important as, as we'd lead you to believe, but that's what they found. But the reason he got so exercised about the fact that we had missed his paper was this, and this was his multivariable analysis, and you can't read it, obviously, from the back of the room, but it was in those 3,300 patients looking at the impact of, of uh, uh, a patient prosthesis mismatch, they, uh, they looked at all of the variables, including valve type, and if you had a bioprosthesis, you had an increased hazard for late death independent of every other risk factor that you can put into the model in these 3,000 patients. So again, it's some suggestion that patients with bioprostheses don't live as long as patients with mechanical valves. Now, why is that? I mean, if the valves are reasonably similar from a hemodynamic standpoint and surgeons are right, you can just reoperate on anybody whose valve, valve fails with the same mortality, then why should there be a difference in mortality? Well, first of all, it's not true that reoperation is, this, the risk of reoperation is the same as first operation. I mean, um, if somebody tells you that, run, don't walk. The other way, it's, it's simply not. It's simply not true. It, the, the the risk is not that much greater, but it's not the same. The other reason is is shown up in this patient, and this this is a patient of mine um, who had a uh, 
who had ischemic mitral regurgitation and I uh, did a bypass and tried to repair the valve and couldn't repair the valve. And so we put in a bioprosthesis, which is pretty standard operating procedure for somebody with ischemic mitral regurgitation. And two and a half years later, I get a call and the, the patient is not doing well. He's in heart failure. Uh, he's not happy. He said, I did well for a while and now I'm just going downhill. Well, he, he's 77. He's, uh, I guess he's 79 now, but he has severe heart failure. He has depressed ejection fraction. He's had one operation. He's got coronary disease and he's got a mitral prosthesis in for ischemic mitral regurgitation. And so you might say, well, this is God putting his hand on the shoulder of the patient. And this is what happens to patients with ischemic mitral regurgitation. But he had the wherewithal to come back to Mayo to get it to, for an evaluation. I don't know which of you all did the study, but uh, he came in and was in heart failure and had had his surgery and he had an echo and that showed an unusual gradient across the mitral valve. And this is what the valve, and we ended up operating on him. That's the inflow side of the valve. It's a tissue valve. And there's the other side of the tissue valve. So it brings up a point that it, it makes a couple points. First of all, it, it's not true that tissue valves don't thrombose. Tissue valves do thrombose. And if you don't pick it up, you'll say, well, it's just heart failure and the patient's going down the tubes. And if this patient hadn't come back to Mayo, he would have died for lack of the diagnosis of bioprosthetic degeneration. In this case, uh, uh, thrombosis rather than calcification. Now, this is another uh, a patient, and I think I think George Gurr, this was George Gurr's patient. This is a 56-year-old man from, um, uh, from Alabama who was an ER physician who had neglected aortic regurgitation. So he comes to operation and his ejection fraction was 21%. He just had stayed away from his colleagues in cardiology. Uh, and he was one who said, I am just too young and vigorous for a mechanical valve. I want a tissue valve. And so we put in a tissue valve and he was similarly two years later in heart failure. And he wanted to come back to figure out what was wrong. But again, he's a, you know, he's got an injection fraction of 21%. He came to surgery late. You could argue that, you know, there's not much to do here, but he also had a gradient across his tissue valve. And there's the inflow side, the ventricular side of the aortic prosthesis. And there's the outflow side of the aortic prosthesis. Now, both of these patients were anticoagulated for three months after surgery, but According to you know the, the standard procedure, we didn't keep them on anticoagulants for a tissue valve. And then there's another patient here. This is a patient that had AV canal. It had multiple operations on the left AV valve. Um, I reoperated because we couldn't re-repair the valve, replaced it with a tissue valve. She come because she wanted to carry a pregnancy through, and she comes back three years later with thrombosis. So I think the, the point is that there are reasons that patients with tissue valves can die earlier than patients with mechanical valves. It has to do with the generation of the valve, the risk of reoperation, and, and somebody believing that there's no, there's no problem with tissue valves. And if somebody's uh, going downhill, it's probably not the valve, it's probably the patient. Now I'll, I'll finish up, I'll finish up with, with just a, a note about um, advances. I don't think there's going to be much advance in mechanical valves in, in valve design. I mean, we've gone about as far as we're going to go. There's no company that's going to invest a lot of money in the mechanical valve market in terms of valve design. But there are advances in managing patients with, with uh, uh, mechanical valves. And I'll just go over a couple of those uh, quickly before we end. And the first, and everybody's aware of this, is low intensity anticoagulation for bioprosthesis. There's new antiplatelet drugs and there's patient self-testing. I'm gonna go through this quickly because I think you're all familiar with this. I wanna get into the patient self-testing and the new drugs. Patient self-testing is dose management by the, by the physician, but the patient tells to testing themselves. And then patient self-management is like diabetics who decide how much insulin they take based on what the, the the uh, blood sugar is, and, and both of these are available nowadays. In fact, the Europeans are way ahead of us with patient self-testing and self-management. And the devices that are used are just like the, uh, the they use for glucose. They're little uh, 
these INR uh, measuring machines have, they, they look kind of like a, a TV remote control. Uh, you take a finger stick, you put it in the machine, and it gives you an INR, their point of care instruments. And there's, there's another one. They use lots of different uh, techniques for clot detection. And what all of the studies of these have shown is that you can improve the time in the therapeutic range by using patient self-testing over usual care, and this is just one study, there's, there's 50 of them that show that, that if you have the patient do self-testing, and self-testing usually is once a week, usual care is one INR a month, you improve the time and the therapeutic ratio. Now the time and the therapeutic ratio is not one of those things that's going, going to get you on the plenary session of the ACC. I mean, that's just not one of those real exciting things. But it's, it's very important because it reduces the risk of thromboembolic complications. As you can see here, in this particular study, you reduce major bleeds by about half, and you reduce recurrent venous thromboembolism, which is what this study was about. This is another study that looked at the time and range with usual care. About 50% of patients were in range, and you can increase that to about almost 90% with patient self-testing. So that's very important. And then this is another study that looked at usual care and patient self-management, and you can increase the time in a therapeutic range from about 60% to almost 80%, and you reduce total, total uh, events from 4.7% to 2.9. Now, this is, this is the one that I want you to look at because it looks at, at usual care and self-testing. This was a group of patients that had valves in. So these are all mechanical valve patients. And if you, if you use patient self-testing, you can reduce the thromboembolic complication rate from 3.6% to a little less than 1%, and you reduce bleeding complications from 11% to 4.5%. Now, I've shown this slide at a lot of surgical meetings, or a number of surgical meetings, and it just doesn't generate the kind of oomph that you'd want. So I decided to change it, and I changed it from usual care and self-testing to your valve and my valve. And, if, and if, if we had, if a manufacturer had a valve that reduced thromboembolic complications by half and reduced bleeding complications by half, you'd grab some market share. I mean, some serious market share. But all you have to do is change the way that you manage patients. And so I think it's, I, you know, we believe in cardiac surgery that it's very important to use a patient self-testing and it's interesting, at least up until about three years ago, 60% of clinics in the United States prohibited self-testing, uh, mainly because I think there's some financial incentive to keep the patients coming back to your, to your clinic. And at that time, only 1% of the patients in the United States used patient self-testing. We've used it here um, for a while. And in fact, we did a study, the very first study that we did in cardiac surgical patients was to see whether you could whether you could learn self-testing in the hospital early after surgery. Uh, you know, that's a time when their patients are getting narcotics or a little fuzzy from the operation. And the question is, can you teach somebody self-testing in that perioperative period where you're trying to, you know, where all, everybody's trying to get the patients out of the hospital as quickly as possible. You're trying to make sure they're recovering well. You're trying to give them enough pain medicine. But to be fair, the diabetologists teach somebody how to use insulin in about 48 hours. So we thought we could do it with patient self-testing. And in this, in this particular study, we started the patients at about the second or third day, taught them how to use the meter, how to record the, the INRs and so forth. And there was very good correlation between the lab tests at Mayo, uh, the INR ratio, which is this, this patient self-testing uh, device, and their uh, uh, MDs uh, recording of the INR. And of the 50 patients that we that we used this on, all of them were able to continue self-testing at a month. There was only one patient that wasn't self-testing, and that patient was a patient at the Mayo Clinic, and their physician told them to stop doing it. So that was the only patient who wasn't self-testing at, at the end of the study. Well, the, the, the future is new drugs, and I did have uh, uh, some material on uh, dabigatran, but I think everybody in the room is probably fam familiar with dabigatran. Um, when we talk about uh, this, the possibility of valve in a valve for bioprosthesis, everybody's heard about that, that if a bioprosthesis fails, now we have percutaneous valves, you can put a valve inside the valve. Uh, 
I've had patients come into the office and say they wanted a bowel prosthesis because in the future they won't have to have the bowel replaced, they can just have it put in percutaneously. I think it's also fair to point out that with mechanical valves, I, I suspect that it's very unlikely we'll be using mechanical valves, I mean, we'll be using Coumadin in the next five years. Uh, Dabigatran almost certainly is to be uh, approved, if not this calendar year, for sure uh, cal uh, in 2011. And I doubt that there's going to be any patient on Coumadin, and that will also improve the, the uh, outcome of patients with mechanical valves. So anyway, I'll stop at this point.